no mayor in New York's recent history uh, has faced challenges like LaGuardia faced. Um, something north of a third of workers in the city unemployed at the time he took office. If you imagine how catastrophic that was. And then World War II on top of that. Uh, so either one of these uh, you know, sets of challenges would have wrecked a mayoralty, one would imagine. And yet LaGuardia is remembered as the greatest mayor in the city's history. You know, most of my life I've been teaching about New York. And all my life I've thought of Vero LaGuardia as the great mayor. You know, say it's sort of like World War I was the Great War. There's the great mayor, and that's LaGuardia, and then there's everybody else. LaGuardia is my sentimental favorite mayor because LaGuardia was the mayor that my parents and grandparents worshipped. And one goes back to a generation of Depression-era New Yorkers who lived in despair and poverty, and LaGuardia and his radio broadcasts and his daily life this feisty little hybrid New Yorker, Italian-Jewish New Yorker, he inspired New Yorkers in the way no other mayor did. His um, mother was Jewish, his father was Italian Catholic, and he was a Protestant, Episcopalian Protestant, you know what I mean? So he's, and he could speak several languages. So in a sense, in that one person, he embodies what New York is, this melting pot. You know, we don't, we don't um, judge people by what's in their blood. Um, I think he was like all the great mayors of New York. He loved the job. He loved it. He wanted to do it. He ate it up. He wanted to go to work. One of the interesting things about LaGuardia is that he did not grow up in the city. He was born here, but he actually grew up in Arizona. Um, so we know him as an Italian-American mayor. But he didn't really become part of the Italian-American community until he arrived back in New York in his mid-20s. He had to learn how to be an Italian-American and how to be a New Yorker. And he learned also how to speak uh, to Jewish American New Yorkers. And he learned how to speak to black New Yorkers. And he learned how to speak to practically everybody else in the city. So the fact that he wasn't of a particular community in the city enabled a kind of cosmopolitanism, which allowed LaGuardia to reflect uh, the values, the aspirations, and in a sense, the self-respect of many different parts of the city. So we think of him as this sort of great symbol of the city's cosmopolitanism. And it's because he was, uh, he was able to talk to all the different communities in the city, that he was able to sort of speak to them in terms of what they thought were great about the communities they were building in the city. The Great Depression got the name the Great Depression for a reason. It was particularly hard on New York City. So unlike when Bloomberg was mayor, when New York kind of missed the worst of the recession, in the Great Depression of the 1930s, New York got it worse than most places. It's because he also got more help solving problems than any mayor in the city's history. Um, if you think of what LaGuardia's mayoralty would have been without FDR's New Deal, it might have looked like John Peroy Mitchell's. Uh, or for that matter, he might have presided over an era of municipal austerity that would have looked like what we think of the 70s as. Um, so understanding the sort of challenges, but also the opportunities afforded by federal policy help us make sense of LaGuardia's great achievements. And so the city built, you know, just think 13 big, huge swimming pools, all of which are still there today. Built big bridges, you know, Whitestone, Drugs Neck, you know. Um, under his watch. Um, so the, the city was not only created jobs, improved Central Park, all sorts of things, while LaGuardia was mayor. He's also, of course, remembered because he wanted to tear up the gambling machines with an ax, and so he had a good sense of PR. He wanted to get the organ grinders off the streets and into um, kind of indoor markets because he didn't like the idea of Italians and monkeys and stuff like this. This is a period where the city is still being built. Um, in effect, uh, commercial development has started filling in parts of the outer boroughs in the teens and 20s. But the city it held, itself has to build an infrastructure to get people from there uh, into Manhattan and from Manhattan out into the metropolitan region and the um, 
Mideast region beyond, and eventually it starts building things like LaGuardia Airport, which are going to connect New York to the, to the world, really. Um, so it's hard to think of LaGuardia without thinking about just how much got built during that period. The Triborough Bridge, the FDR, uh, what's now the FDR Drive and the West Side Highway and the Henry Hudson, uh, the Lincoln Tunnel, the Queens Midtown Tunnel, and LaGuardia Airport, and eventually Idlewild, which we now know as JFK. He, um, when there was a newspaper strike, he read the funny paper famously over the radio to the kids. You know, these are the comics, and you don't deserve to be punished because the grown-ups are having a fight. But so I'm bringing you the comics. I mean, just think what a wonderful public relations move that is. I mean, you can't separate the word. And I don't think when he did it, he, he, he did it because he embraced it. He was having a great time. You can see him when he's reading it. Hey, let's go to the next thing. You know, it's Dick Tracy, whoever it was. You, you can't fake this kind of stuff. You know, he, he wanted, I think he was a genuine person. But there's also a sense of what a mayor ought to be. A mayor ought to be a man of the people. A mayor ought to speak to everybody. A mayor ought to reflect what's great about the city. A mayor ought to be in charge. Um, these are all things that become essential parts of LaGuardia's political personality, um, which are taken up in the post-war decades uh, and then really restored by Koch in the 1980s. And, and uh, so LaGuardia has set an example for what the mayor of New York should be. He was driven. He wanted to succeed. He wanted the city to succeed. He worked hard during World War II because at the beginning of World War II, the city wasn't getting quite as much as, it, as its per capita in military things. He took a trip to Washington to get that. He, of course, wanted to be made a general and run things that way. In some ways, the single greatest black mark on LaGuardia's record is his response vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japanese communities after Pearl Harbor participates immediately in this just roundup uh, in the city, detainments on Ellis Island. And even after it's clear that these people who are American citizens pose no security threat, um, LaGuardia doesn't want to hear anything of it. He doesn't want Japanese people released from internment camps. And so this sort of civil liberties uh, element um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis particular communities, but also um, the way public space is going to be allowed to, to be used in the city uh, is something that would strike us as, as um, the antithesis in some ways of what we would think of as liberal politics being about. But he was a leader. He was a doer. And um, clearly, the city was in better shape when he left than when he, he took over in the middle of the Depression, and by the time he left, the city was the capital of the world, for sure. I mean, the UN was coming here, London and Paris, and Berlin and Tokyo and Moscow and Warsaw, and all these other cities are practically in ruins or they're in poverty, and New York is at the top of the world. Now, is that all LaGuardia is doing? No, but um, I think he was a fine leader, and I'm not surprised and I'm not sorry that he gets the vote as the greatest mayor New York ever had.